Hey guys, Dr. Ryan here. This PAT preparation video is sponsored by DAT Booster, the most powerful online resource for the DAT. So the perceptual ability test is the spatial reasoning portion of the dental admissions test. And I want us to tackle the PAT like a series of games. And we're going to unpack different strategies that you can use to win and confidently win these games. So the PAT has 90 questions in total and is made up of six subsections that appear in order with 15 questions each. And you'll have 60 minutes total to answer all of those questions. So there are two necessities when studying for the PAT. Number one is pure practice. Do as many practice questions as you can. And I strongly recommend checking out DAT Booster. I'll leave a link in the description for them. And the second necessity when studying for the PAT is finding strategies that work for you. So my goal with these videos is to present a bunch of strategies, and my hope is that one or more of them will stick with you so that you can be confident on test day with how you'll approach every single problem. You'll know exactly what to expect and exactly the steps that you'll take personally to solve each and every problem. So with that, let's get started. So top front end, also called view recognition, is the section that we'll cover in this video. Like all sections, it has 15 questions, and I recommend about 50 seconds per question for a total of approximately 12 and a half minutes on this section of the PAT. So you're presented with pictures from the top front and end views of various three-dimensional objects. And the views are without perspective, which means the views are straight on without any indication of a third dimension. The view looking down on the object is shown in the upper left-hand corner as the top view. The view looking at the object from the front is shown in the lower left-hand corner as the front view, and the view looking at the object from the right side is always shown in the lower right-hand corner as the end view. Now, these views are always in the same positions and are labeled accordingly. So in these problems, two of the three of those views are shown with four alternatives for the third missing view in order to complete the set. And the game is figuring out which one of those four is correct. And it's not always the top view that's missing. Sometimes it's the end view, and other times it's the front view that's missing. So my first test strategy for you is to break it down to the basics and really familiarize yourself with the rules of this game and how the three views work. So here we show the top view, front view, and end view, which, referring back to our keyholes video, were the three viable views that we were using to pick apart the 3D object. But now we're given the 2D views and we work in the opposite direction to build up a 3D object in our minds. So here we have a solid rectangular prism and the three views that correspond to that shape. Now let's say we add a hole in the middle of the object. So we would adjust the top view in order to reflect that wide opening but this front view and the end view, as they stand right now, would make it no different from the previous shape. So, dashed or dotted lines resemble some kind of change in the shape that we can't see from that view. They're able to show that there's some change that's happening that's hidden if we were looking straight on from the front and straight on from the side. And that's really, really crucial to understand because most, if not every problem you see on the, on the exam will have some amount of dotted and dashed lines. So now let's say we add an extra extension to the previous shape. Again, the top view can reflect that extra extension pretty easily. For the end view, this time we can add on this little extra extension with solid lines because we can obviously see this change from that direction. But with the front view, how does this one change? Or does it change at all? Well, we have a new solid line that we need to add in order to 
show this change in elevation because now we can clearly see there's going to be a solid line here, there's going to be a solid line here, and there's going to be a solid line here. This dashed line will still stay, but what about this one that represents the change in the shape hidden? It's going to be exactly in the same location as this one. If you can imagine we're standing there, those two things are going to be completely superimposed on one another. So if that ever happens, and a solid and dashed line are superimposed on each other, the solid line always wins. Now we can bring everything together. So every question will either show you the top and the front, front and the end, or the top and the end views, and you have to figure out the missing one. And each of these pairs of views can be related to one another to help us solve the problem. It's basically what we've been working through already, but I think it's really helpful to visualize it in this way and draw either these straight lines connecting the views or these rainbow arcs connecting the different uh, lines and different components of every view. And you can see how everything's perfectly lined up, not only by shape, but also by size and everything's to scale with each other. You can also mentally rotate that top view 90 degrees to the right, or you can rotate the end view 90 degrees to the left into this top right corner in order to help you line everything up depending on what views you're given in the problem. Whichever way works best for you mentally is what you should do while you're practicing and then on the exam. So my second test strategy has to do with this concept of line counting. So line counting is a strategy where you count the amount of lines in a certain view, then you match it up with the provided answer choices. Now, in this case, it might work if we were counting, let's say, the horizontal lines here. We have one, two, three, four, five, and let's say the end view is missing. We would count one, two, three, four, five vertical lines, and if none of the other answer choices that were there had five lines, we would select that as the correct answer and move on. Unfortunately, this doesn't always work, and in fact, it won't work most of the time because test makers caught on to this shortcut and made the problems more difficult in order to compensate. So instead of using line matching, instead of using line counting, I should say, we use line matching. And this is my own refined line counting method. And you might be asking, well, how is it any different? So instead of just counting the lines, we analyze what specific lines they are and also consider the vertices or the corners where two or more lines meet together. And both the lines and the vertices together will help you figure out what the missing shape is. So this is something you can think through for every single top front end problem. It's actually pretty simple when we break it down. So the basic concept of line matching is that there are two types of lines that inform your answer and two types of lines that are irrelevant for that answer 99% of the time. So let's talk through this. If you are given the top and the front views in your problem and you had to solve for the end view, the idea here is that the vertical lines of the top view inform the vertical lines of the front view. They're going to line up with each other. The horizontal lines of the top view are going to translate to the vertical lines of the end view. So that's what we want. That's an important one. The horizontal lines of the front view will inform the horizontal lines of the end view. So that's also important and that's something we want. So all said and done, the vertical lines of the top and the front views here, not all that important. We are more concerned with the horizontal lines of the top view and the horizontal lines of the front view because both of those together will give you everything you need to know for the end view. Again, that's 99% of the time, unless you get a really complex problem, this is going to work. So in this scenario, I wouldn't even bother looking at the vertical lines of the top and front views. I would get all my information from those horizontal lines. 
So you can just switch this around. Like let's say we're missing the front view. Now all I'd look at are the vertical lines of the top view, which would inform the vertical lines of the front view. And I would look at the horizontal lines of the end view, which will inform the horizontal lines of the front view. And so you can do this depending on whatever your pair is, you can figure out what lines you should be looking at. So let's apply our strategy so far to this problem that we saw at the beginning of the video. Now one tip I'll suggest is to always start with the outer boundaries first. So if we draw our lines from the outer boundaries of this shape, we would draw these straight up here, and then we would draw these rainbow arcs around the corner, and a rainbow arc around the corner here, and so we would have a shape that's this tall rectangle shape, and that's everything that we see in the answers lines up with that. So sometimes you can rule out an answer choice right away if it doesn't conform to the shape that you're expecting based on the outer boundaries. In this case, you can't, but in some cases you can, and that makes it really nice and easy. Next, look at the solid lines and the vertices, specifically the ones that end along the shared borders with the missing view. When I say shared borders, I mean the top edge of this front view and the top edge of this end view. They're the ones that are going to be in close contact with that top view. And I know this seems repetitive, but this is so crucial to unpacking the, the essence of the top front end game and how everything's related. So at the end of the day, we only really care about the vertical lines from both of these views. We already have our outer boundaries figured out. Now we can draw up from the other solid lines and corners. So we have one here and we have one here. Now I'll re-put in those outer boundaries. So we're gonna have one there and one there. So almost every single time this method will work. And these have to appear as solid lines somewhere in the missing shape. Sometimes it's at the borders or sometimes it's in the middle of the shape, but they have to be solid somewhere. And the important thing with this is we can see that there is a small amount of space between the right boundary and that second line from the right, which we see, we see that in both A and B. In C and D, however, there's no such solid line that's appearing just to the left of that outer boundary. So right away, I would rule out C and D as possible contenders here. Now when we get down to two answers, I'd like to see what's the difference between those answers because it's usually very subtle and it's usually just one thing that's different. The only difference between A and B is this, this line here that's solid in A, whereas in B it's dashed. Also note how both of these have this dashed component here, so that part's the same, it's really that outer part that's different. Now if it's dashed, that means we cannot see it from the top view, the missing view, and it's hidden behind some other shapes. With that in mind, look at these dashed lines in the front and end views, which is the next thing I tend to look at after exhausting all of the solid line information. So these dashed lines here and here, they line up perfectly with this rectangle that's inside the outer frame. So if we were to draw those up here and here, you would see that they would line up perfectly with the inside of the frame and the same thing with the end view here. So that's telling us that there's some kind of indentation in the shape from the top view, that all of this area is depressed, kind of like, like a sandbox with an outer wooden frame, let's imagine. So this lip that goes around the entire shape is definitely visible from the top view. The only part that's hidden is from this 
triangular extension. It kind of leans out over here and it's blocking our view from the top. So if I were to erase everything here, you can see how this lip is totally visible around the entire object except right here. When we're looking down at it, this triangular extension covers that part of the shape. However, that extension only occupies this much amount of space. It doesn't come out here or here, so that part of the shape is completely visible. So those lines should be solid, and the only dashed line should be right where it's hidden by that extension. So the answer here is A. Here's what the shape looks like as a three-dimensional object. You can see the sandbox with the triangular shape that's sticking out. So here's a review of the order that we used in the previous problem and that I typically use to work through the problem systematically so that we leave no lines unaccounted for. I always start with the outer boundaries, then I look at the solid lines and vertices at the shared borders first and they usually, but not always, reference solid lines at the shared border of the missing view, while sometimes they relate to solid lines in the middle of the missing view associated with something sticking out like we saw in the previous problem. Then I look at the solid lines or vertices in the middle of the shape, which usually, but not always, reference dashed lines in the missing view, or again, maybe something that's sticking out from the center. And then if necessary, I end with the dashed lines at the shared border and then at the middle of the shape. And either way here, these are going to be referencing something in the middle of the missing view that's blocked out by some other component or shape. So that's the general order that I work through from most high yield to least high yield information for each of these problems. And then one general strategy that I love to use is to use process of elimination. And if I'm able to whittle it down to two answer choices, figure out the difference between them and focus on that feature to finish off the question. So let's do another practice problem. And you can feel free to pause the video if you want to in order to work on this one by yourself first or keep watching if you wanna see how we get to the answer. So as always, we start with the outer boundaries first. And so we would draw those to the right, and we would draw these as a rainbow arc down. And so we're going to be left with uh, some rectangular shape that's taller than it is wide. Now I do want to point out that that shape doesn't necessarily have to be a perfect rectangle. It just has to occupy that space without um, being too small or overextending those boundaries. So next we identify the important lines, which are going to be the horizontal lines in the top view and the horizontal lines in the bottom view. So next we identify the important lines, which are going to be the horizontal lines in the top view, which inform our vertical lines, and our horizontal lines in the front view, which inform our horizontal lines of the missing view. Then we go and focus on the solid lines and vertices at the shared borders. So the top view has those outer boundaries and then it has a fairly big space here until the next important horizontal line. So we can draw that one down and that's it for solid lines. And so if we go just from that information alone, we're expecting this amount of space between the, the two rightmost solid lines. And so we can see in A and B, that space is really small. And that doesn't match up with the amount of space we're expecting. Whereas in C and D, that's definitely looking like the proper amount of space. So I would rule out A and B just like that, right away. Uh, once again, we're down to two answer choices. So let's find the difference between them. Well, D has some added features like these little dashed lines here and this solid line across. Those are things that C does not have. So where are those coming from? Well, it's these two horizontal lines from the front view. 
and since they're not at the shared border along the right side, we expect them to translate as dashed lines to the end view. But the question becomes, how far do those dashed lines extend? Do they stop there, or do they keep going like in D? Well, we have to ask the question, what's blocking those two lines? Well, the answer is these two tall rectangles. So this really tall one will color in green, and this slightly shorter one to its right will color in yellow. So we can also locate those rectangles from the end view. The tall green rectangle we know has to come up all the way up here because that's the tallest shape from the front view and that line is going to match with that line. And then the yellow rectangle is the one right next to it. And so that line is going to match with that line. So now we know where our green and our yellow rectangles show up in that front view. And since we know that both of those rectangles are blocking our lines, we know the dashed lines have to extend through the entirety of both of those rectangles. Well, they go through the green one, but they stop for the yellow one. And that doesn't make any sense because we know the yellow one is in front from the end view of these two guys. And so C doesn't make any sense. D is correct because those lines stay dashed until we clear that yellow rectangle and then they become solid. St stays dashed and then becomes solid once it clears the yellow rectangle. So the answer is D. If you watched my keyhole video, you know that I love to use spray paint. These are awesome images from DAT Booster. And being able to color these in, coloring in the different shapes, of these practice problems while you're studying, I think can be super helpful in order to help you visualize what you're looking at. And so here is what that three-dimensional object looks like with the four rectangles of different elevation. Pretty cool. So next I wanna quickly cover some advanced strategies, some tips and tricks you can keep in the back of your mind when you play this top front end game. So the first is that diagonal lines and vertices or corners where two or more lines meet influence both of the other views. That's because diagonal lines represent slopes or gradual changes in elevation that are by nature three-dimensional. So you can appreciate how unlike vertical lines and horizontal lines, vertices like we see in this front view influence both of the other views. These peaks and valleys appear as both vertical lines in the top view as well as horizontal lines in the end view. So vertices are incredibly important because they influence both of the other views. Feel free to solve this one on your own if you'd like. I can explain the correct answer in the comments if you guys would like me to do that. So this is the question we looked at just a few slides ago, and this is another really powerful shortcut, and I definitely would remember this one, that pegs that stick out of any of the three surfaces are visible as solid lines from all three views no matter where they are. So whenever a shape is sticking up or out from everything else, it's projecting and sticking out from one of the views, it's going to be solid. So this shape is solid here, solid here, and also solid here. And that makes sense because that's the part of the shape that's sticking up above everything else. So anything that sticks out is going to be solid from all three views. This works for both rectangular and cylindrical pegs. And here's the last one, that holes or tunnels that go through the object are visible as solid lines in one view and visible as dashed lines in the other two views. So this works for both square or round holes. And this is really helpful to differentiate from pegs because if you just looked at the front view and nothing else here, you might think that that's a peg that's sticking out from the front view, but you don't know that until you look at the others and you can visualize that 
uh, there's a tunnel that's cutting through this shape through the entire object. So with all of that, let's combine all of our strategies and tackle this question that we just saw from the last slide. So we have diagonal lines, holes, pegs, and a ton of stuff going on in this one problem. But don't get overwhelmed. You have all the information and strategies you need to get this one right. So if we draw our outer boundaries, we have a rectangular space to fill in. We're going to have something that's wider than it is tall. And again, everything, all the answer choices match this shape. And so we can't rule anything out right away, but it's just nice to know that we have this kind of shape we're filling in. And then we move to our solid lines at the shared borders. So we have, for the front view, we have one here, and we have one here that's fairly close to that outer boundary, but not quite. Now something interesting is happening here, because if you notice, there's no solid line where we'd expect it in any of these answer choices. So what's going on here? Well, don't let that throw you off. That's the power and influence of diagonal lines. And in fact, you can see that this part of the shape is sloping away from us as we go down. So as we go down this rectangle, it's s sloping further and further away from us as we can see from what's going on in the end view. So at this point, there's nothing solid to show. It's just one big solid roof on the top of this shape. And this part just slopes away from us as we go down. So that's what's going on there. Now with this solid line though, we get some valuable information. And there's a certain amount of space between those two lines that we talked about before. And so A and C, those two lines are awfully close together and it doesn't correspond to what we would expect from this amount of space. B and D are a lot closer those look correct. So we're going to rule out A and C right away. So we're left with two answers. So you know the drill by now. Let's find the difference between them. So here we have this shape. Here we have this wider shape with a missing dashed line. So the dashed line is missing in D and it's there in B. And we already talked about this part of the shape that's hidden underneath the roof. So even though it's not a solid line, we need a dashed line to match with this line. We need something to match with it. And in D, there's nothing there. It's totally missing, and that can't possibly be correct. We need something to match with that line. And so B is the only one that can possibly be correct at this point, and that is the answer. So here are the three thirds of the shape colored in, and here is the three dimensional object from DAT Booster showing you this sloping part, how the roof is completely solid with no solid lines across the top, but we do need that dashed line there to represent a change in elevation that we can't see from that top view. Now the best and most reliable way to solve these problems predictably is to visualize the 3D object in your head from the two views shown. And hopefully, all of these strategies that I showed you in this video can help you get there and crush this part of the exam. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel for more on the DAT and all things dentistry. A huge thank you to DAT Booster for making this video possible. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.